Hi there, everyone. Welcome to Sustaina Tella. Can everyone still hear that? Is there music playing? Oh no. Can everyone hear the music now? I All right, awesome. Okay, so again, welcome everyone. Yes, welcome everyone. This is our Sustainatella, our Sustainatella on fertilizer. We're going to be teaching everyone about the importance of not using fertilizer during the rainy season and what the impact is and what are some alternatives to spraying fertilizer during the rainy season. So we're just going to give everyone just a few minutes to trickle mm -hmm. in and we'll be starting shortly. You can feel free to dance along with the music. It's funky. Happy here, Marion. All righty, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, today we're doing our sustainability on the fertilizer ban, and we're going to be explaining why we should care um, and how we can do something to be better about the uh, fertilizer just throughout the year. So while on Zoom, I just want to go over some of our house rules. Firstly, we're asking all participants to stay muted and our videos are disabled. Um, but if you have any questions or you would, you would like to engage with the host and panelists, feel free to use the Q&A box. And we've also opened up the webinar chat um, for everyone to be able to engage with. Um, so feel free to use the chat and share your comments with everyone or all panelists and attendees. So today, our friends that we'll be having on our presentation include Aaron Cover, the Education and Outreach Manager with Manny Waterkeepers. We have Samantha Tiffany, the Environmental Resources Manager um, for our City of Miami Beach's um, Environment and Sustainability Department, uh, Environmental Division. And then we also have Jessica Lorenzo, our Environmental Specialist for the division. We also have Dalton Goolsby with the Urban Horticultural Program, um, and he is the supervisor. Thank you everyone for joining us and I'll hand it off to Aaron to start our presentation. Amazing. Thank you, Rolando. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for dedicating your Friday morning to learning a little bit more about fertilizer and why it's causing issues in our waterways. Uh, like Rolando said, my name is Aaron. I'm the Education and Outreach Manager at Miami Waterkeeper. Um, and for those of you who don't know who we are, we are a local nonprofit and we focus on conservation of Biscayne Bay and waterways all around Miami Dade County. Um, and we kind of tackle that through three different approaches. So we do education and outreach, which is what my team uh, and myself, we do that. Uh, we also have a science and research department. So we have a team of scientists that are out there doing research and, and constantly uh, monitoring the, the quality of the water. And then we also have a legal advocacy and policy team. So we um, you know, have some policy specialists that are getting really involved in the you know, legislation, political aspect of conservation um, and potentially getting involved in any litigation as, uh, as necessary. So I will go ahead and, oh, I should have clicked earlier. That's me. Um, so today we are going to be talking specifically about fertilizer and the negative effects it has on our waterways. So we have this cute little video. Um, 
I don't know if I can play that. Rolanda, I don't see the play button. Oh, there we go. Mr. Fertilizer is full of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, which is applied to our lawns and yards to help plants grow. However, during the summer months, we get lots of rain, which makes it hard for our plants to absorb Mr. Fertilizer. Instead, Mr. Fertilizer and his nutrients get washed away by stormwater into our storm drains and eventually outfalls that lead to canals, the bay, and to the ocean. In these water bodies, there are tiny plants called algae that love Mr. Fertilizer's nutrients, just like our lawns and plants do. So much so that the algae consume all his nutrients and grow and grow and grow. This can create what we call an algae bloom. Algae blooms are a problem because they clog our waterways, turn the water green, smell bad, can kill fish and wildlife, and can be harmful to people. You can do your part to prevent these blooms by using less fertilizer, not applying it anywhere near drains or waterways, and using it only when we know it isn't going to rain. In fact, you can skip the fertilizer completely completely during the rainy summer months. Help keep Mr. Fertilizer in our lawns and not our waterways. So that is just a very cute uh, overview of fertilizer and how it's impacting our waterways, but we're gonna really dive into it um, right now. And we're gonna talk about the ecological impacts the health impacts, and then also the economic impacts of too much fertilizer going into our waterways. So like we learned in the video, um, fertilizer, too much fertilizer in our waterways can cause algae blooms. It can really uh, affect the water quality of our bay, of our canals, our rivers, and then also cause um, some significant damage to our habitats and the animals that live in those habitats. Um, so first, let's dive a little bit deeper into algae blooms. So the process kind of takes place, you know, we have nitrogen and phosphorus, which are what make up primarily fertilizer. Um, and that can cause an increase in algae because just like fertilizer helps our plants grow on land, it does the same thing uh, in water to aquatic plants. Um, so it can cause um, algae to bloom like crazy which in turn can cause low dissolved oxygen in our water, um, or just basically deplete how much oxygen we have in our water, which fish and other species living in Biscayne Bay or our canals end up not having enough oxygen to survive um, in the water, which unfortunately can sometimes lead to seagrass die-offs and fish kills um, and create kind of what we call dead zones or areas in the water where life can no longer be supported because there's no oxygen. Um, so this has, you know, potentially catastrophic consequences ecologically, uh, but also has the potential to create public health risks. So it's not only affecting our plants and animals, but it can start affecting those folks who live near the water or who recreate on the water. And then just in terms of water quality, um, similar process to how it uh, causes algae blooms, but when we have too much fertilizer entering the waterway, uh, we get that increase in algae growth, and that can lead to increases in turbidity or just uh, how clear the water is. Um, so the water doesn't, it gets really murky and cloudy, um, which prevents the sunlight from being able to penetrate into the water column. Um, and if our sea grasses or coral reefs that live on the bottom, if they can't get that sunlight and photosynthesize, we often see a lot of die offs because of the algae blooms are just blocking that photosynthesis from taking place. Uh, again, a similar process for habitat loss. Um, so I'll skip over the the first parts, but basically too much algae can smother or block the sunlight, preventing um, seagrasses and coral reefs from photosynthesizing. Um, and these, you know, decreases in these really important habitats, uh, like seagrasses and coral reefs can cause um, really negative impacts to our natural aquatic species. Um, Manatees really rely on seagrasses and they lost a big food source. Um, all the other organisms that use seagrasses and coral reefs for habitat and to get all of their, um, you know, survival resources are negatively affected. 
And then having these, you know, dramatic changes in the habitats and, and the biodiversity um, and how many different species and how many individuals of each species we have in these habitats can cause a regime shift. So basically, you know, um, 20, 30 years ago, the entire bay had really healthy, you know, thriving seagrass beds. But unfortunately, now a lot of those, like 80 to 90% of those seagrasses have died off and it's just been completely taken over by algae. So our bay is, is not very happy right now. Um, so now we're going to talk about the health impacts of fertilizer. So we're going to talk about how they, um, how too much fertilizer in our waterways impacts humans and also wildlife. Um, so some of you may have heard of HABs or harmful algae blooms. Um, so basically they just occur when the algae growth is just out of control because of all of the phosphorus and nitrogen entering our waterways. Uh, but also some species of algae can actually produce toxins, which can be potentially harmful to us. Um, when we have these HABs, uh, especially with species that are toxic, the, the toxins actually concentrate in the species that are living in the water. And then when we fish them and consume them, um, we can kind of absorb those toxins as well and it can lead to health problems. Um, some species of algae, I'm sure some of you are familiar with red tide, they can have um, airborne toxins, which can also be harmful when people are near the water and breathing that in. Um, it can cause a wide variety of issues um, you know, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, neurological, and then of course, respiratory issues when you're breathing it in. Um, and especially with younger, you know, kids or, or older folks or um, people who just have maybe asthma or respiratory issues. So it can cause a lot of, um, you know, public health issues. Um, also, we kind of talked about it already, but it can cause significant damage to our wildlife and the habitats. Um, so these blooms can cause fish kills, um, can actually affect, you know, manatees and dolphins and other marine mammals, um, can cause them to die, but they can also cause them other physical injuries. Um, so sometimes the algae can, you know, physically entangle an animal um, or can have some of those, you know, neurological or more physiological issues, depending on the species, uh, which makes it hard and not a very great healthy habitat for a lot of our aquatic species to survive in. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about the economic impacts of having too much fertilizer in our waterways and how that is negatively affecting our commercial fisheries, tourism and recreation, medical costs, and even, you know, something as big as storm resiliency. So living in South Florida, a lot of folks rely on fishing as a main, you know, food source, as a source of income. Um, but these these algae blooms can cause really massive fish kills. Um, I don't know how many of you guys were in Miami in August of 2020, but we had the biggest fish kill we had ever seen. Uh, we had over 27,000 fish and other you know, aquatic wildlife die because there was a period of five days where there was just zero dissolved oxygen in the water. So all of these you know, animals couldn't survive. Um, and that was kind of the tipping point for Biscayne Bay where we realized how much having all these pollutants and, and nitrogen and phosphorus coming into the bay um, was really was really damaging and we had a really you know catastrophic fish kill. Um, but these, you know, depending on the scale of a fish kill, it can lead to harvesting closures, um, which is basically just when the state limits the number and type of fish that can be kept so that's affecting everybody who's, you know, catching the fish and selling the fish and then eating the fish. Um, because of this, it can cause prices to increase. Um, and then, you know, a lot of fishing dependent communities can suffer some economic losses just because of too much fertilizer, nitrogen, and phosphorus getting into our waterways, kind of causing this domino effect. It also can really affect our tourism and recreation. Um, just like fishing, South Florida really relies on the tourism industry for our economy. Um, and when we have these massive algae blooms and fish kills, um, it doesn't, it's not pretty, it's not cute. People don't want to go swimming or snorkeling or recreate in water that is brown and green and disgusting um, and can also, you know, cause those health issues. 
Um, you know, we tourism contributes hundreds of millions of dollars and creates thousands of jobs every year. So having an, an unhealthy bay, um, you know, is more than just an ecological issue. It, it starts to affect our entire state's economy. Um, and we need that. We need that tourism and, the, and that water-based recreation um, for our economy. Another thing that people might not really think about is that if somebody is affected by uh, an algae bloom or specifically the type of algae that have toxins in it, uh, it can rack up a lot of medical costs depending on how severe their reaction is to it. Um, so they could become sick and have to go to doctors or get hospitalized and then they won't be able to work. So there's a lot of smaller um, but really impactful issues that are a result of algae blooms and too much fertilizer going into the waterways that not a lot of people think about. Um, and then a big one is storm resiliency. So living in Miami, we're kind of ground zero for climate change and sea level rise. And we really rely on healthy marine and aquatic ecosystems to be natural barriers to storms and sea level rise. So when we have you know, our seagrass beds and coral reefs, negatively affected by fertilizer and these algae blooms, um, it can affect their ability to act as barriers um, to hurricanes and, you know, storms and tides, um, which, you know, can cause a bunch of property damage. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody has seen the flooding in Brickell. Um, having healthy coral reefs and seagrass beds and mangroves are a really important step to help mitigate that. And fertilizer ending up in our waterways just kind of cascades all these issues um, and it reduces our ability to be resilient to these storms and to climate change and sea level rise. So some things that you can do um, in Miami-Dade County just to protect your lawn and to help Biscayne Bay, uh, follow the local fertilizer ordinances. And I know we'll talk more about that um, next. Um, use fertilizers with uh, without phosphorus. Our um, soil in Florida is pretty naturally rich in phosphorus, so we don't need any more. Um, using a slow release nitrogen mix of phosphorus, or excuse me, nitrogen. So if it does end up in our waterways, it's not all 100% releasing at once. It's kind of slowly releasing it so it spreads it out. Uh, making sure we're applying fertilizer at least 20 feet away from a waterway or storm drains. Um, properly disposing of lawn clippings. Um, so not putting them on our storm drains or just, uh, you know, leaving them on the side of the road. Um, and then also participating in events like this where you get trained and educated on best practices um, and what you can do to be more sustainable and reduce how much fertilizer, um, you know, is going into the waterway specifically from your lawn or from your home. Um, and I'm gonna pass it on to Sam right now, but I know we'll, we'll pass it over to Dalton shortly from IFAS where he'll talk more about um, some natural fertilizer alternatives. So thank you guys so much. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, this is my contact information and you can also get that from Rolando as well. So I will pass it on to Sam. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Samantha Tiffany and I'm the Environments Resources Manager with the, the, within the Environments Resources Management Division. And I'm joined here by one of our environmental specialists, Jessica Lorenzo. And I'd like to just take a quick moment just to quickly introduce our full team. We are a small but mighty team and we've in included our um, email addresses so that if you would like to contact us with any environmental concerns, we have it below. And just to give you a little bit of background, uh, the Environment and Sustainability Department is comprised of three divisions. In our division, the Environmental Resources Management Division serves as the city's in-house liaison um, or in-house consultant and is the li liaison between the city and other governmental um, agencies for environmental concerns. Our division provides many services, including plan review, environmental permitting assistance, um, natural resource management, technical advisory, staff and community, community trainings like this one. And we also work to implement ordinances that target specific environmental concerns. 
Our division has worked diligently to implement ordinances that protect our environment, like I said earlier, and one of these is the fertilizer ordinance, which took effect on June 1st, 2021. And the goal of this ordinance is to reduce nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus from entering Biscayne Bay. Some highlights from our fertilizer ordinance include the establishment of a prohibited application period, establishment of fertilizer-free zones, and also the creation of the City of Miami Beach Biscayne Bay Protection Trust Fund. The Biscayne Bay Protection Trust Fund is a trust that will be used to plan and manage environmental assets and programs to further water conservation, non-point pollution prevention activities, water quality improvements, um, marine and coastal ecosystem enhancements that essentially that protect the city's water resources and Biscayne Bay. Our department also works to promote our fertilizer ordinance, including the, the effects of excessive or the incorrect use of fertilizer on Biscayne Bay through the We Heart Biscayne Bay campaign. And the pamphlet on the right is an example of how we educate the public on our ordinance. Our stormwater system collects pollutants from the uplands that then end up in Biscayne Bay. Nutrients enter the stormwater system from agricultural runoff, leaking septic tanks, residential and commercial fertilizers, and yard clippings. As Aaron discussed earlier, fertilizer is one of the most impactful pollutants degrading the water quality of Biscayne Bay because it contains nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, which can cause algal blooms, seagrass die-offs, and fish kills. And now I'll hand it off to Jessica to get into a little more of the details of the ordinance. Thank you, Sam. Good morning, everyone. I will be going over some of the prohibitions addressed in our fertilizer ordinance. Um, our fertilizer ordinance prohibits the application of fertilizer from May 15 to November 1st. This takes into account our rainy season and keen tides. Um, however, outside of this time frame, fertilizer is also prohibited under any heavy rain events or if a flood, tropical storm, or hurricane watch or warning has been issued by the National Weather Service. The fertilizer ordinance also establishes a fertilizer free zone 20 feet adjacent to any waterway or storm drain. This means if your property is 20 feet from a storm drain or waterway, you're not allowed to use fertilizer at any time during the year, not just during the prohibited application period. The ordinance also recommends low maintenance zones 10 feet adjacent to waterways and storm drains. So as you guys can see on the picture to the right, the overgrown vegetation along that waterway is considered a low maintenance zone. So this low maintenance zone is designed to not require fertilization, watering, or mowing, and its purpose is to capture and filter runoff that may enter the waterway. Other requirements established by this ordinance are proper application rates, which establish proper fertilizer application rates outside of the prohibited application period. So for example, no more than 0.5 pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet shall be applied to any turf or landscape area in one application. The ordinance also establishes pollution reduction by requiring grass clippings and other vegetative matter to be kept free from storm drains and waterways. So for example, make sure that when you're mowing your lawn, you're not just blowing your grass clippings into the street or right away. Instead, you make sure that you're sweeping it and collecting it into a trash bag for disposal later, as shown in the picture below. And lastly, the ordinance establishes training and licensing requirements for commercial and institutional applicators. So for example, all commercial institutional applicators of fertilizer within the city shall abide by and successfully complete the six hour training program offered by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. The ordinance also established special requirements for golf courses in high impact areas like public parks and athletic fields. So golf courses in high impact areas like public parks and athletic fields are exempt from, from the prohibited application period, provided that they follow the Florida Department of um, Environmental Protection best management practices for Florida golf courses. And they're also required to follow the provisions of the Florida Green Industries best management, best management practices. The ordinance also requires that these areas report monthly fertilizer use to the city, and additionally, the ordinance requires that golf courses, public parks, and athletic fields, um, whenever they have renovations, they meet minimum requirements for low impact development. So this just means that if renovations are being done in, in any of these types of facilities, they need to make sure that fertilizer runoff isn't entering the neighboring areas. And that is the end of our presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Um, in 
you know, if nobody has any questions, if you have any questions in the future, you know, please feel free to contact us to that number listed on the slide. You can also get more information about our fertilizer ordinance in the below website at mbrisingabove.com slash fertilizer. So now I'm gonna pass it off to Dalton from IFIS to talk about Florida friendly landscaping. Thank you. All right. So um, hopefully you guys are learning a lot. Um, my name is Dalton Goolsby. Thank you guys for, you know, listening through this and uh, taking everything we're saying to heart. Um, you know, as Floridians, especially as residents of Miami-Dade County, um, you know, we all have a responsibility to help maintain our waterways, you know, like um, Jessica and Aaron and Samantha were mentioning, you know, we depend on our, our bodies of water for um, food, recreation, economy, you know, it's a, it's a big uh, source of um, obviously fun, right? We get to go to the beaches and enjoy a nice day at the beach. However, um, through, through um, not the best landscaping practices, I would say, you know, the traditional cut, mow and blow, apply fertilizer, just want to make everything green, don't really care about the effect we're having, the impact we're having on the environment. This kind of mindset has um, obviously stressed our waterways and um, it's lead, leading people to look for uh, alternative ways, uh, alternative methods to the conventional, you know, kind of cut, mow, and blow landscaping that we see so often. Um, and this is where Florida Friendly Landscaping comes in. Uh, my name is Dalton. I'm with the Urban Horticulture Program uh, with the U University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences here in Miami-Dade County. Um, my program deals with homeowners. Uh, let me go ahead and go to the next page. For, you guys, for those of you who don't know, the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences offer um, free resources and education on a number of topics. We've got agents in the building ranging from topics on uh, fruit, fruit trees, ornamentals, all kinds of things. My program specifically deals with um, homeowners, local governments, things like that, lobbying to uh, make people understand our impact as homeowners and how we can reduce our impact whatever way possible. Um, so this is the Residential Urban Horticulture Program. Uh, we help oversee, obviously, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, which we're going to talk about. Um, we do all kinds of cool things with that, like yard recognitions. Um, we can even uh, make suggestions to help you increase your um, eco-friendly uh, landscape as well. Uh, we also have an awesome Master Gardener Volunteer Program where we train uh, local residents um, in ways of identification, um, we give them the resources they need to help also do what we do and educate homeowners and people like that. Uh, they teach classes, do all kinds of fun stuff. And actually, our next Master Gardener class for this year is about to start soon. So if you want to get involved with that, learn more about that program, you can send me an email after this. We also do uh, rain barrel and water conservation workshops. Uh, we're um, funded partially by the Water and Sewer Department uh, here in Miami-Dade County. And um, they they... Uh, would like us to do these kinds of water saving initiatives, not only saving the um, quality, the quantity of water, but also the protecting the quality of that water as well. So the Florida Funding Landscaping Program, like I mentioned, is kind of uh, a, a, an alternative to the conventional form of, of landscaping. You know, uh, people get the yard guy and they pretty much just listen to whatever the yard guy tells them, um, you know, whether it's uh, applying certain fertilizers, insecticides, things like that. Um, Florida Friendly Landscaping uh, promotes um, more eco-conscious, eco-friendly landscaping um, that are that's focused around these nine principles uh, um, that we'll, we're going to lightly touch on and uh, and talk about. Um, so these are our nine principles here. Um, we're going to briefly break down each of those. Uh, and the cornerstone principle I like to say is um, the right plant in the right place. So. Uh, basically, the, the reason this I call this our cornerstone principle is because if you're selecting the correct plant and placing it in a spot in your landscape where it's best suited to grow, you know, based on light conditions, soil conditions, water availability, um, salt tolerance, especially on Miami Beach, things like that, you're going to be going a long way to setting your plants up for success and your landscape up for success long term. You know, if I've got um, a group of drought tolerant plants, I'm going to try and plant those together in a spot in my yard that maybe gets a good amount of sun. Um, and over time, you know, uh, I can water, I can water all those drought tolerant plants maybe on one irrigation zone. So um, let's look at this picture here on the slide. 
You can see in this one picture, we've got all different kinds of plants in what I would call one irrigation zone. We've got a drought tolerant flower in the bottom left corner. We've got your grass, which is gonna suck up a bunch of water. That, that grass needs a lot of water, a lot of nutrients to look attractive, unfortunately. Uh, we see we've got some kind of like little flowering annual back there, it looks like, um, some, some kind of grass. And then we even got a palm tree right there. On this one picture within about five feet of each other, we've got um, five or six different kinds of plants and they all have varying degrees, needs of water, varying needs of sunlight, um, varying needs of maintenance. So what this is creating, um, this area right here, some plants are always gonna be stressed where others may be happy. So this is what I mean by um, planting the right plant in the right place, grouping similar plants based on their water and sunlight needs will go a long way for setting your, your landscape up for success. You know, um, if I'm watering my grass and this, this drought tolerant plant's getting a lot of excess water, it's gonna look really stressed and unhappy. Um, and we may, and your yard guy may recommend you do any number of uneco-friendly things to remedy that plant when you could have just planted in a different location, given it less water and it would be doing better by itself naturally. Um, watering efficiently, that's a good segue into our next, um, our, our next topic here. Watering efficiently is obviously extremely important. Um, and when you're watering our yard, uh, and especially during our rainy season, we've got 60, uh, you know, a global, I mean, an annual average is about 60 inches of rain every single year in Miami-Dade County. Um, with that amount of rainfall, we don't really need to be watering any extra during our rainy season, especially if you have established plant beds. So um, right plant, right place. Maybe if you've got um, an area in your yard that's always getting inundated with water, you know, it, it, it pulls up and the grass is always dying or looking unhealthy there. It's like really swampy. Well, maybe the grass in that location is not the best spot, right? Um, maybe you don't need irrigation in that area. Maybe you can install some nice aquatic edge plants to help suck that water up, um, deal with that uh, sitting water in your landscape, help bring that down and also have a nice attractive focal point in your landscape with native flowering plants that attract wildlife. Um, so basically the, the awesome, the, the thing you wanna be focusing on here with watering efficiently is trying to reduce stormwater runoff wherever possible. And it's not just stormwater runoff, it's also gonna be irrigation runoff as well. You know, if you're over irrigating right after you applied fertilizer, just like you saw in that video that Aaron showed, that um, that fertilizer is going to be washed straight out into the bay. Um, so it, by doing things like installing a rain barrel to help capture rainfall, is that those go a long way to help reducing stormwater runoff and runoff pollution. So um, look look to the water, Miami Dade Water and Sewer Department for all kinds of water saving initiatives. Uh, rebates and things like that that you can apply for through the county. I'll go ahead and highlight a few that we work on. Um, one of my very favorite ones and something I'm very proud to be a part of is our landscape irrigation rebate program. This is a completely complimentary program. We'll literally come to your, um, your house for free, um, do a pre-assessment of your irrigation system, make recommendations on ways it can become more water efficient, whether that be changing out heads, um, maybe installing a smart timer, Maybe it's uh, removing irrigation and installing drought tolerant plants. These are all kinds of things you can get rebates for, get money back for from the county for doing. Um, if you have a, a large property, such as maybe you have a, like a multi-unit apartment complex that has landscaping as well, or maybe you have a business here in Miami that has landscaping, there's also a separate program for that uh, where you can actually receive uh, $2,850 for retrofits to your landscape irrigation. Now, uh, there are a couple stipulations. It does have to be pre-existing irrigation. We do not rebate for installation of new irrigation because obviously that doesn't translate to water savings. That's just gonna use more water. But if you do have a pre-existing irrigation system, this is a great program because, you know, living in Miami-Dade County, this is a pretty old county, right? Lots of old houses, which means lots of really, really old outdated irrigation systems. And um, sometimes it's not even that they're outdated. Sometimes it's just that these systems are broken. And just by even turning on your irrigation system, you're wasting copious amounts of water. Um, the homeowner program here is a five-year program with $500 available each year, meaning uh, $2,500 maximum rebate available after, um, you know, after we come out and make our recommended changes. You can go ahead and hire a contractor to do the work for you. It's a great program that saves Miami-Dade County, millions and millions of gallons of water every single year. Um, it's something that's very important and uh, very crucial in aquatic areas like Miami Beach. 
Uh, we do multiple properties there every single year. So I highly encourage you guys to reach out to me and I can uh, get you signed up for this program if you're interested, if you have an old outdated irrigation system. Honestly, the savings, you'll, the changes you'll make, um, the amount of savings on your water bill, if you're paying for your water, will more than pay off um, these kind of retrofits you will be making. Um, this is just a nice little graphic. This is from 2020 as well. So it's about three years old. This shows between all of our water saving programs, how much water we're actually able to save Miami-Dade County. And I, I'm on a small team of only five people. So if us five people can make this kind of change, then imagine um, what the entire city of Miami Beach can do, right? If we all come together and make small adjustments, right? Um, one, what, one of my favorite sayings is, you know, it, um, it takes an army to enact change, right? You know, we can only do so much by ourselves maybe making small adjustments to save a couple gallons here or there. But if, you know, 3 million people in Miami-Dade County, if we all make adjustments to save a couple gallons of water, that goes a really, really long way to helping protect our bay, um, recharge our aquifer, and uh, remedy a bunch of these water issues we're seeing. Um, now, I mentioned our rain barrel workshops. Uh, we do have a rain barrel program. Um, this now actually just got sponsored by the Water and Sewer Department as well. Um, through our program, you can actually buy a rain barrel it's refurbished uh, food grade plastic, so it's not contributing to any new plastics being uh, created in the environment. And you can actually get a rebate now for purchasing a rain barrel um, through our program. So rain barrels are $100. Um, they're high quality 55 gallon rain barrels. And uh, you can actually get a $50 rebate back from the water and sewer department for purchasing a barrel after attending one of our workshops. We do one every single month. Um, and actually we've got one coming up at the Miami Beach Botanical Garden um, in a month or two. So you can go on their website and read more about that and get signed up. And this is a uh, rain barrels are a great way to harvest rainwater to prevent it from running off your landscape and collecting all kinds of pollutants like dog waste, cigarette butts, um, all kinds of nasty things, fertilizers, pesticides, you name it. It's a great way to reduce runoff to prevent it from getting in the bay in the first place. Hmm. Um, fertilizing appropriately is obviously very important. That's why we're here today, right? Um, now, uh, the, the, the ladies here in our presentation, they've already talked a lot about it. So I'll, I'll kind of um, leave that for if you have any questions at the end. But obviously, you know, um, I, I like to include this picture of the man fertilizing directly into the water, because if you're fertilizing during our rainy season, that's essentially what you're doing, right? You're basically just fertilizing the bay, fertilizing the algae. So that's a nice little uh, fun picture there, because that's literally what you're doing. Um, so maximizing mulch is a great way to also reduce watering, right? I mentioned that your, these nutrients run off your, your landscape, not only from the rainfall, but also from irrigation. Um, mulch is great because it helps reduce the amount you need to irrigate because it helps retain moisture. And also mulch is a great way to help amend the soil naturally without buying fertilizers. Um, as, as mulch breaks down around your plants, it's literally turning into compost and creating natural plant foods that, um, you know, if you're allowing leaf, leaf litter to fall and join in with that mulch, you're going to really be supplementing um, the, the uh, nutrients in your soil around your plant beds. <clears throat> now, attracting wildlife. Um, this, is, this is my favorite, probably, um, principle because I'm a huge butterfly geek. Um, I'm actually doing a guided butterfly tour in the um, city of North Miami, uh, Elaine Gordon Forest here in a couple of weeks. So if you're interested in learning about butterflies, how to identify them, and what to plant to attract them to your landscape, I recommend you come to that. Um, however, um, attracting wildlife to your yard is extremely beneficial. Um, not only do they help kill off uh, bad pest insects and pests like that, um, they also provide a beautiful focal point in your yard. You know, we have an amazing migratory bird season. Um, we have a, we're blessed with the year round butterfly season, right? So if you're planting these things in your yard, other than just, you know, grass, right? You're actually going to be attracting things into your yard. If you have kids or grandkids, um, it, it becomes a awesome conversation point to, you know, talk about birds and butterflies and point them out and get them interested in the outdoors, make them stewards of the outdoors early, right? And attracting wildlife is a great way to do that. And the great thing, like I mentioned, attracting that beneficial wildlife to your yard, that native wildlife will also help you manage those yard pests in responsible manners, right? Uh, you don't need to go applying um, harmful chemical to kill these pests every time uh, you see something pop up in your yard, right? How many of you guys get these Luber grasshoppers or these white flies? The two huge issues, right, in Miami-Dade County. You know, we're we are blessed with an amazing agricultural community, but also on the other side of that sword, there um, 
we've got pretty much every single pest in the entire world right here in Miami-Dade County. You probably know that if you've ever tried to grow a garden in your landscape, I doubt it was very long before, you know, pesky little insects started popping up, right? Um, now, I, I will say that we do have resources for this as well, um, and it's a free resource. I mentioned everything here in IFIS is um, a, a free resource, right? Um, so my background, actually, when I graduated from the university is in plant and insect diagnostics. So if you see a pest in your yard or you see a spot in your grass or a spot on, on, on your plant leaf, before you listen to exactly what your landscape guide tells you and go buy harmful chemical, you can send us a photo, send us a sample to my email, and I will help you identify whatever, if it's a pest, I can help you identify the pest. Maybe you, maybe it's a butterfly, I'll help you identify a butterfly. Or I'll give you guys the example I, I, I'm so tired of seeing all the time. Um, I, my, my specialty actually is in turf grass, even though I give turf grass so much hate because it needs so much water and fertilizer to, to thrive, um, which is not really Florida friendly, right? But um, I do have a specialty in turf grass diseases. So I, all the time I get, I get this sample, especially around this time of year when it's so hot out and so wet, right? Um, it makes the perfect condition for algae to bloom. And our, our warm season turf grasses like St. Augustine are extremely, extremely susceptible to fungal diseases, right? And fungus obviously blooms when it's hot and wet, which is right now. Um, so this time of year, it's so common. I get a, a sample from a homeowner. They say, my yard guy tells me I have chinch bugs. So I've been applying you know, chinch bug chemical on my yard and my, my yard only looks worse. What's going on? I have no clue what to do. So I'll, I'll get their grass sample in my office. I'll check it out under my microscope. First of all, it's a species of grass that doesn't even attract chinch bugs. So they're applying a harmful chemical that's running off, literally doing no benefit to the yard. It's actually hurting the yard even more. Um, and then they're applying this chemical that's damaging the grass further. And then the whole time they really just had a, a fungal disease due to overwatering their landscape um, because their guy tells them, oh yeah, you got chinch bugs, just apply this, apply this chemical and then just water more and it'll go away. Well, actually you're amplifying the issue, right? So um, I always say use your resources, it's a free resource um, and we'll literally direct you in the, the right direction of what to do to treat it. If it's a fungal disease, we'll give you the, the directions for that, bacterial disease, right? Um, viral disease, or maybe it's just a pest insect or maybe it's a nematode, right? There's tons and tons and tons of options that it could be. So don't just take your guy's word for it, send us a sample and get an expert's opinion on it. Um, so recycling yard waste is a great way um, to help amend your soil and prevent you from the need to buy um, more soil or, or fertilizer from you know Home Depot every time you wanna do a, a yard project, right? Uh, composting is a great way to literally create a um, a free source of plant food and soil in your own landscape. Um, so this is another quick little soapbox spiel. Uh, you know, you got the cut, mow, and blow landscapers. They come to your landscape, they cut your limbs, they cut your grass, and they're going to haul all that waste away, right? Well, in the process of growing that grass and that tree that they just cut that limb off of, they're getting those nutrients to grow directly from your soil. So when they're cutting those limbs and those grass blades off and hauling them away, you're, you're, you're hauling away nutrients from your landscape. And over time, what we see is a loss of nutrients in the landscape because people are not nutrient cycling. And one way you can nutrient cycle is to return all the expended nutrients um, from you know, yard debris by composting them, turning them back into soil and then reapplying them throughout your landscape. Um, it's a great way to help ensure there's not a loss of nutrients over time in your landscape. And actually, uh, I almost didn't even mention, we have a great program that's sponsored by the Solid Waste Department. Um, every other month, we're doing one at the end of this month. I think it might be filled up, but there's one coming up in two months. We do a compost workshop through the Miami-Dade um, library system. You can go um, look up the Miami-Dade Public Library System on Google, go to the calendar events and look up compost. We literally do a one hour presentation every other month and you can get a free $150 composter through the Solid Waste Department just for attending this workshop. So just go on Google, look up uh, the Miami-Dade Public Library System, go on their event calendar and search compost. And it's at the end of every other month. Um, sign up for that and you can get a free composter and start doing this in your own yard. And uh, UF IFAS also has tons of resources or you can just reach out to me, I'll make it easy and um, walk you through how to compost successfully because it's not as easy as just throwing limbs in a bucket and letting nature do its thing. I mean, it could be, but uh, if you wanna do it efficiently, I'll, I'll tell you how. 
Reducing stormwater runoff is obviously so important. Um, we're talking about this now. And um, another thing that's great about great about composting is it helps reduce the stress on our landfills, right? All waste goes to landfills and just cut the, the bottom line is that uh, yard waste is not, a, the, the landfill is not a good place for yard waste to decompose, right? All, the, all this green waste, when it goes into a landfill uh, and decomposes without the presence of oxygen, obviously, because, you know, landfills, they just dump trash on top of it and then compact it all down to where there's basically no free oxygen in that system. And when things break down in the presence of uh, no free oxygen in that system, the, the only thing that can possibly turn into is methane gas and carbon dioxide gas, which are our two most harmful greenhouse gases. So therefore, green yard scraps and you know food waste, it, shouldn't, it, it, it really should not be going into your household trash. If you can compost it, that, that would be going a long way to reducing environmental problems in Miami-Dade County. Um, reducing stormwater runoff is also very important. Uh, you see, I want to direct your attention to the picture on the top right corner of all the grass around the storm drain. This is so, so, so bad because um, so we, you hear about the, the fertilizer ordinance is basically saying that the verbiage is that no phosphorus or nitrogen fertilizers can be applied to the landscape during our rainy season. Well, nitrogen helps leafy things grow, right? If you see like a blade of grass, that, that thing is pretty much pure nitrogen, right? And nitrogen is one of the main things we want to prevent from getting into our bay. Well, if you're blowing all your grass clippings onto our storm drains, those are going to wash right out into our bay and break down in the water. And essentially, that's basically pure nitrogen right there going into our, our storm drain. So we want to definitely avoid that. Collect that uh, those grass clippings and you can compost them and make really, really healthy compost. So um, obviously, our impact is uh, something called non-point source pollution. So point source pollution would be say a factory or a nuclear power plant, right? I can point at that. I see those big smokestacks coming up out of the out of the, the pipes. And I say that's a I can point at that and say that's a source of pollution, definitely. Non-point source pollution is more diffuse. Um, think of it almost as the entire village of Palmetto Bay or the city of Miami Beach, right? Uh, you've all you've got all these homeowners here um, improperly applying fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and other chemicals. And uh, these are going to become sources of pollution. Maybe it's not all from one source. It's like I said, it's more diffuse. It's the culmination of all those improperly applied fertilizers that becomes this non-point source pollution. So this is our impact as homeowners. And it's, it's what we should be looking to reduce however way possible, whether it's creating a bioswale to collect running water and help filter it out before it gets into the storm drain, whether it's, um, you know, collecting grass clippings and composting them or whatever you decide to do. Um, to help reduce non-point source pollution. If we all pick up, you know, a little bit of the slack, we'll go a long way to remedying the um, environmental issues in Miami-Dade County. And then obviously protecting the wild front, you guys heard the 20-foot uh, barrier rule. This is actually uh, one of our principles here in Florida Friendly Landscaping as well. Um, basically, you want to have a maintenance-free zone. The, the, right, the bottom right picture is a good example. You can see they've got those um, long-lived plants there on the water's edge, aquatic edge plants that have nice deep root rooted systems that help to filter out any impurities before they get into our aquifer. And they also act as a natural barrier. Um, those plants are native Florida native plants that don't need any fertilizer, don't need any water, don't need any herbicide, pesticide to grow once they're established. So um, I always recommend planting Florida native, Florida friendly plants because for that exact reason, they need less water, less fertilizer, all that stuff, you know, they've survived in Florida for thousands of years without fertilizer. Why would they need fertilizer now, right? Um, so I mentioned we do yard recognition. So if you have if you have a Florida yard, um, no invasives, you know, you have a good irrigation system or no irrigation is even better. Um, you can actually get recognized for having a Florida friendly landscape. This is one of our master gardeners, Kurt Klaus. I just recognized his landscape not too long ago. Um, beautiful yard, tons of butterflies awesome plant selection. And actually, he doesn't have a single blade of grass in his whole yard. He has a grass alternative known as frog fruit, or if you're a butterfly fan, you know that's a host plant for three or four native butterflies here in Miami-Dade County. So you can stand at one end of his yard and stare to the other, and literally, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating, there was about 10,000 white peacock butterflies just all over his yard. It was one of the most magical things I've ever seen. So um, University of Florida actually did a study and they found that nine out of 10 people found a Florida native yard to be more attractive than a grass yard. So if, if nine out of 10 people find them more attractive, then why don't nine out of 10 people have a Florida native yard? That's just what I think. Um, I think they're way more attractive, beautiful 
and they, they require less maintenance. They don't require basically any water and you're going to have butterflies and birds in your yard. I mean, what's, what's, what can you complain about there, right? So um, if you guys are looking for plant selection, this is an old slide that showed links to a publication that was produced by uh, my boss and her old boss and a couple of um, other really great plant gurus here in Miami-Dade County. You can go on Google and type that in, low maintenance landscape plants for South Florida, and it's a nice little pamphlet. However, there's a new um, couple new resources that I want to bring to your attention. If you guys go on uh, the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store, you can actually look up. It's called FFL Plants. I'll put it in the chat right now. FL Plants, if I can. Yeah, I can. You can literally type that into the Google Store or the App Store, and it's a free app produced by the University of Florida. You can literally type your zip code into this app, and um, you can filter out a bunch of different criteria, like maybe you want a ground cover that has a purple flower and is a butterfly attractant. Well, you can type in your zip code, type in all those criteria, and it'll pick back a list of purple flowering ground covers that attract butterflies for your zip code. It's an amazing resource, FFL plants. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And uh, we have a bunch of materials online. Uh, you heard a couple people mention the, the green industry's best management practices. Um, if you're working in the green industry, you know about this, and maybe you know me because I, I teach actually the fertilizer classes here in Miami-Dade County. Um, so we do those about once every other month as well. And yeah, all these other things, if you want to know about our irrigation rebate program, our composting program, our rain barrel program, they're all rebatable or like in the case of the composter, you can get that completely free. Um, if you're a teacher, um, an educator, maybe you have a public garden that you manage, we actually have uh, rain barrels for donation for you, actually. So if you want to reach out to me, uh, Coca-Cola of South Florida was generous enough to donate us um, a, a collection of rain barrels to donate to community gardens and local schools. So reach out to me about that as well. And the only thing we got to do is come out and teach your kids one class. It's really easy. Um, so if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. I saw that a couple of people were asking for links to um, the, the butterfly tour and the Miami Beach Botanical Garden uh, rain barrel uh, talk. So I will link those in the chat as well for you. Um, you see my email down there below. If you guys ever have, like I said, a yard problem, a pest problem, send me a photo or send me a sample would be even better to our address. Uh, you can get our address by emailing me. And then, of course, uh, I'm also our social media manager, just to kind of do it all. Um, so you can follow our social medias there. And I post all of our classes the week of on our social medias. The main one I would say, would, the main ones would be our, our Facebook and our Instagram, but I do post on Twitter as well. And then we do have a selection of videos on our YouTube uh, Miami Date Extension. Um, the one that I will recommend uh, based on this presentation today, uh, go on there on our YouTube and look up, um, actually, I don't think it's on our YouTube, it's on the Florida Native Plant Society YouTube, but you can go on YouTube and look up um, Barbara McAdam, uh, Florida Native Plant Society Rain Gardens talk. She has a recorded presentation on creating rain gardens. It includes rain garden plant selection, things like that to help filter out um, stormwater runoff as it's occurring. And you can also create a beautiful area in your landscape, like I mentioned, if you have a spot that's always getting filled with water and grass just never grows there, it gets really muddy and mucky and gross. Well, why not cover it up with some beautiful native flowering plants and attract some butterflies? That's what I think, right? Why, why are you going to keep planting grass that's just going to continually fail there when you could have a beautiful, attractive, um, you know, conversation starter in your landscape? So um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, if you stick around for a couple of minutes, I'll quickly run to... Um, internet and grab those links for you guys for the composter oh not for the composter that's kind of filled up for the next couple of months but for the rain barrel workshop and for um uh, what was the other the guided butterfly tour i'll go get those links for you now thank you Dalton. Thank you, of course thank, thank you everyone guys. else for your presentations today um i just wanted to take a quick minute also to share our we heart this game bay pledge if everyone can take out their phone real quick and scan this QR code, you'll actually be taken to our pledge, which has a few action items that you can incorporate into your daily lives, such as what we discussed today, like not spraying fertilizer during the rainy season, but also some other action items that you can include in your daily lives to protect this game day. Um, so, for example, if you have a dog, making sure that you're cleaning up after your dog's pet, um, you're after the pet waste so that that contamination doesn't end up in our waters as well. I'll just give you all a few quick minutes to scan the QR code and participate, and we'll be concluding our presentation.
And then for anyone still around, Dalton is still is he's sharing some links. I see that he's shared two links so far. And if you guys haven't been to the Miami Beach Botanical Garden, it's amazing there. Ricky, um, the garden manager, she gets us out there like once or twice a year to do talks. So um, yeah, stay stay up to date with their event calendar, and maybe you'll see us um, doing a butterfly presentation there in the coming future as well. Thank you everyone for attending. I gotta hop off actually. Um, I gotta we're getting a mulch delivery here in a couple of minutes, so I gotta go handle that. But thank you everyone for attending. Um, I'll go ahead and also post my email in the chat because um, I know it, that we're going through slides pretty quick there. So if you guys have any questions for me or a sample or maybe a spot in your yard or something like that, um, never hesitate to send me a, a photo and I'll help you get to the bottom of it. Thank you guys. Bye. And for anyone else who's interested in the presentation, we'll have a copy, a video copy of this presentation on our website. And you can find more information by visiting our website, which is MB risingabove.com um, and just some more information that I quickly wanted to share for anyone interested in composting Miami Beach has two composting uh, locations where you can take your food waste so in South Beach you can go to the Miami Beach Botanical Garden um, their composting facility is open um, and we also have the North Beach Compost Hub which you can find the location of also on mbrisingabove.com and their location, I believe, is open 24-7 with um, access through a code that you would have to sign up for on our website. So if you have any questions, feel free to email us and we're happy, we're happy to answer. Thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a great day. And again, thank you to our presenters. Bye, everyone.